My name's Andrew White and I'm the Associate Dean in the School for all of our executive education work um, and responsible for all of our corporate relations as well. Um, so this is work that we do with uh, corporates and with senior leaders who are in jobs as opposed to students who are um, here on a, on a full-time basis. And I'm delighted to be here this evening with Mark Wilson. Uh, from Aviva. I've known Mark for a number of years now. We've interacted at various events and things. Um, and we're going to be here for an hour. Um, I'm going to ask a few questions um, for about the first 30, 35 minutes or so, and then it's going to be open uh, to you. Mark has said that he will take questions on any subject. Um, and so um, please think through. This is a whole point of this, is to really give you an insight into what it means to be a leader in one of the major companies in the UK today. So Mark, can I kick off by going back to go forward? Um, financial services has been through an awful lot over the last 10 years. Um, 2008 changed things, um, brought things to attention. And you've been a leader right throughout that. So could you just give us a sense of you know, what your careers look like and what your reflection is on that whole time period um, from when that occurred to kind of where you are now and the various roles that you've played within that? Well, uh, thanks, and Good evening, everyone. You know, it's, it's nice to be here. It's nice to be um, you know, associated with this uh, fine business school. You know, 2008 was one of those remarkable times in history because it's not one of those periods at the time that you could read a book around because you know, a crisis like that economically and globally hadn't happened since the Great Depression. And to put it in context, I woke up that morning in 2008 at, when AIG collapsed and at the time I was the CEO of a company called AIA which is the biggest subsidiary of AIG. And um, in fact I didn't wake up so I didn't go to bed. And I realised something big was happening when I was on the phone to three regulators at the same time, the Bermuda Monetary Authority, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority and the New York Fed. And it was 4.30 in the morning. And um, then I went to work past a media scrum and we were headlined in pretty much every media outlet in the world. And, and a lot of our branches around Asia, there was queues. In Singapore, for example, there was queues around eight city blocks trying to get in and redeem all our products. And you realise you have a problem. And what do you do? You know, there wasn't any course you could have taken at this business school or anything else to actually prepare you for it. And, and you know, what do you do? That, that was a crisis that you don't want to do too many times. I didn't go home for, I don't know, about 13 or 14 days. I don't think I had a full day off for eight and a half months. And it was an extraordinary period in, in history. And I guess we got through it. And at in AIA, we ended up doing the, uh, at that time, was the biggest IPO in corporate history, globally. And so we went from a crisis to a pretty remarkable outcome with a whole lot of people. and. Yeah, that was a fun period, but I wouldn't necessarily want to do it again. <laughs> so here you are now, CEO of arguably one of your, um, the UK's most successful insurance companies. And when you lead today, in a sense, history has an echo. Mm. Has that changed the way you have to act as a CEO? You know, have you, have you have, you know, is it still just about shareholders? Is that the primary thing you focus on, or have you have, you know, has it caused you to reflect about what Aviva's purpose is in, in, in the world? Yeah, well, I've got pretty strong views on businesses' role uh, in society generally. Now, different parts of the world have a, in different business schools, have a different view about what the purpose of business is. Uh, I'll say one thing that's somewhat controversial. There is no business that exists for any period of time whose role is just to make money. And if you think it is, you won't survive. Because, yeah, and our business has been around 322 years. It started November 1696. So we got a bit of history at Aviva. And, but no business has ever survived with the role of just making money. They must have a social purpose. They must be contributing to society. Because if you don't, what are you there for? Now, don't get me wrong. 
you have to make a good profit. You must make a wonderful return for shareholders. That should be growing every year. You should be growing your business or you won't survive and your business won't be sustainable. But making money is not the purpose. Making money is the outcome of what you're doing, not the purpose for being. Does this make sense? Mm -hmm. And you know, Aviva, uh, I do turnarounds. I've always, I've done turnarounds for many years and I like going to big companies and big brands that are broken. Aviva was broken. Um, we didn't have any excess cash. We didn't have any excess capital. The last five years, I think we've added about 14 billion pounds of surplus cash in the balance sheet. So now we have a fairly large cash pile that we need to do something with and probably spend some of it. But um, yeah, first of all, you have to, when you go into those things, you have to do a few things. First of all, you have to make an organisation realise that it needs a turnaround. You have to shake it up. You have to shock it. You have to shock that system. Secondly, you have to change a lot of the leadership and management teams. And you know, basic management theory suggests if you're doing a turnaround, you've got to change at least 40% of the people. With my senior team, I changed 70. And um, it's, some of them are for values, some of them are for they haven't got the right intellect, or some of them are just in the wrong job. Then you've got to sort out the strategy, and then you've got to execute. And it all sounds really easy, and all of them are really hard. Mm -hmm. So can I just push you on this, yep. you know, this social thing? I think a lot of people have been critical of companies where they've said, oh, it's just greenwashing. Or I think in our conversation earlier, you talked about if you're associated with the UN, it's blue washing. And um, so is this, just a, is this just good CSR? Is it just good PR? Or does it actually go down into difficult business decisions that you're making that maybe in the short term actually financially hurt you? I mean, how do you, how does this bite in the organisation, and how is it not something which can just be dismissed as, you know, in a sense, it's 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 a good thing to do, but it just might be superficial. Yeah, well, I'm a bit of a cynic, um, and a lot of the CEOs I deal with around the world, it is just greenwashing. And I see people with products that I think happen to be really bad for you, and they think if they do a bit of charity or do a bit of UN stuff, then it makes it okay, and it doesn't. No, it, it really does. So concretely, what have you done to you know, bring that social purpose alive? Well, I'll give you some examples of what we're doing. So we manage about £500 billion um, uh, as our asset base. And um, our liabilities, you know, we're, it's an old company, can be 30 or 40, 50 years. So we say our investments must be focused on the long term as well. So for example, if you're talking about uh, sustainability and climate and environment, well, we go and we say, okay, well, we'll talk to, we, we hold massive investments in a lot of these companies, and we say to oil companies, if you're not doing something about green, if you're not being doing something about becoming more carbon neutral, improving the environment, we will sell you. Um, tobacco, we um, are in the process, and I announced this last year, of exiting about 1.4 billion pounds of investment in tobacco companies, bonds and equity. Because we made the decision that how could we stand up with our value set and support an industry that uh, when its product is used as directed, over 70% of its customers will die from a smoking related illness. I think that's a problem. Yeah, I think that's a major problem. So we said, right, we'll put our money where our mouth is and we'll do something like that. But, you know, it comes down to values. And I don't mean values like honesty and integrity. If you haven't got them, you shouldn't be in business. It comes down to what you want to stand for as a business. And one of the th good things, I guess, we did at, at Aviva, I guess, nearly five years ago now is we said, OK, we've got four values. Uh, now, we had a strategy. We've got to get good returns. And the financial targets are pretty easy to do, frankly. The values are harder, and values impacts culture, and culture eats strategy for breakfast. It really does, every time. And the thing that's been probably most enduring, we only have four values. One of them is create legacy. It means thinking long term, being a good ancestor, making decisions now that will stack up in five or 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 years time. Because as a CEO, I might be judged financially over what happens this year or next year, I'm actually going to be judged what happens in 10 years after I've le uh, left much more. So that's the first value, create legacy. Next one's care more, which basically just means do the right thing. I couldn't really care a whole lot what regulators say, because often regulators get it wrong. I care about doing the right thing, and if you do the right thing, you won't get in trouble with regulators. That's, that's the second one. Our third value is something we call never rest, which basically means always be unhappy with the status quo. 
Always have a situation where our very best isn't quite good enough. Always have this desire, this urgency that says we've got to change what we do for the better. And the last one is, is just cool complexity. I think business these days is way too complex. Business is so simple. A lot, of this, a lot of people here are MBA or MBA graduates or whatever. Business is simple. It's basically about cash flow, it's about numbers, it's about customer propositions, it's about values, and you put them all together and you can be this massive company. It's not that hard. So there must be some things that aren't simple though. And so I don't know how well you sleep, but let's assume that you're the kind of person that wakes up at four in the morning. Don't look like that, do I? And <laughs> <laughs> if, if you were that kind of person, what would wake you up at four o'clock in the morning? Actually, I sleep really. Um, I'm actually waking up at four o'clock tomorrow morning and got to go to Amsterdam for the day, yeah. Um, okay, there's, look, there's only two things that would keep me up at night. There's actually only two. Uh, one of them is geopolitics. I'll, I'll take, look, in, um, before I tell you, in about, I think it was 1957, the then British PM, his name was Harold Macmillan, and some fresh-faced reporter came up to him and said, um, you know, Sir, Prime Minister, Sir, um, what blows you off course? And Harold Macmillan looked at this a young guy and he said, events, dear boy, events. And it doesn't matter what you do, it doesn't matter how good you are as a leader or a CEO or whatever, there will be events that happen, just like the global financial crisis in 2008. There will be events that happen. At the moment, there's no events internally in the company that would worry me because we've got a balance sheet that's quite remarkable and you know, the company's going pretty well right now. Uh, but the things that would worry me that would blow us, us, of course, is geopolitical events. I worry about people with their hands on big red buttons around the world. I worry about war. I worry about um, people doing dumb things politically. Um, in the UK perspective, I still worry about parts of Brexit, or I, although I think we'll get through it. Um, and the other, so first is geopolitical. Um, you know, you've got all the tensions also in uh, Korea and other places. Uh, the second thing is cyber, is cyber crime, uh, is hacking. And I don't know any of the people here um, that uh, into that field, but it doesn't matter how good you are as a company, or how many hundreds of millions or billions you spend on cybercrime, you will never be 100% safe. It is not possible. Because the crooks will always go as fast as you can, and it's just, it's a constant arms race. It's a cyber arms race. If you overlay on that the amount of state-sponsored cybercrime or cyber terrorism, you can never be totally safe in cyber. And although I think we've done extraordinary things protect, uh, protecting our perimeter, there's always people in any business in the world that do dumb stuff, and that can make you vulnerable. So can I pick on Brexit for a moment? And um, We are covering a lot of ground. We are we? covering a lot of ground. Um, and I think it was, was it a couple of weeks ago that you were invited into a meeting with the Prime Minister and the Chancellor, yep. um, with a number of other CEOs. Um, I I think we would all love to have been a fly on the wall um, in there. And you might not have wanted to be. Could you give us any insights about what, you know, your perceptions, your understanding, your what went on in that kind of meeting? You know, I've been um, a bit outspoken on the government for their stance on business over the last few years. And uh, bluntly, I think UK at the moment is one of the few countries in the world that doesn't support its business. And I think it's unacceptable that any members of the government, either government or opposition, come out and say business is bad, big business is bad. I think it's, uh, I think it's ridiculous and, and uh, naive for any person in the government to do that. Um, and you know, if you have a look at what business has done, business is the biggest force for social good in history. Have a look at China alone. Over the last, what, 15 to 20 years, 680 million people have been brought out of poverty. Now that was government policy supporting, basically capitalism to be blunt, and supporting business and bringing people out of poverty. And the UK right now needs business. It also needs big business. And I think it's about time the government said, 
We support business, we support big business, and by doing that we support our economy and we support people in the UK, because that's how we improve people's lives. Now, so that was one of the messages in that meeting, bluntly, and that was the, and I think this was the first meeting I've seen for quite some time where the PM basically said, I'm pro-business, I'm here to help, we are gonna get the right deal in Brexit. Uh, that was, I think, a big step forward. Um, there was a general view uh, in the room that people wanted um, in some s spaces to have consistent regulation where there's global markets and things like that, that makes sense. If you've got investment banking, maybe you should be a rule taker. But there's a large sec sector if we're going up from Brexit where we're all saying we should not be a rule taker. Just to be clear, I voted to remain. But my view is now if we're leaving, there's no point leaving having no say and then being a rule taker because the other countries are looking after their own interests and make no mistake, they are there to try and take jobs from the UK and put them in Paris and Frankfurt and everywhere else. So that was the second thing. There's a few technical things and people in the business school and in the finance would be interested in there's something in asset management. The UK is one of the biggest asset management centres in the world and the regulation around, it's called delegation of authorities where um, you can trade stocks or things from any part in the world and it means billions and billions of pounds to the UK each year. Um, parts of the EU are trying to change that to hurt the city and hurt the UK. Um, we, our strong view is that we shouldn't. But the most important thing that was said to the PM and the Chancellor was um, in terms of a transition. Uh, I think the Prime Minister calls it an implementation period and it was, we need to agree it, we need to agree it now before any deal is agreed, we need to agree it in a very short space of time. Now if we can do that, we'll take out a lot of the uncertainty out of Brexit and that will help the UK. Uh, the longer uncertainty drags on, uncertainty is like kryptonite to business. You know, if, if decisions are uncertain, businesses don't like that, investors don't like that, they will invest in other places. And um, and then the last eh? Sorry, go on, keep going. and the last thing is frankly, we need to step up our trade negotiations with other countries: China, U.S., Japan, maybe New Zealand. Um, you know, for what it's worth, New Zealand's easy to do a trade deal. For those of you that don't know, I was born in New Zealand um, all those uh, years ago, and uh, New Zealand did the first trade deal with China, and I was involved in the edges of that. And that's the reason why New Zealand's economy has been booming now for well over a decade. Mm -hmm. And uh, the UK, we were a nation here of you know, traders and, and um, internationally, you know, and square shame sailing ships way back then, but we could be again, but we have to look further afield than the EU in a post-Brexit world. Mm. So are you, are you being courted by you know, other leaders who are looking for, you know, not necessarily your business to relocate, but are they looking, you know, certain European capitals are, you know, you move in those circles? Uh, you'll, you'll get me in trouble here. Um, yeah, look, I've, I've had meetings with uh, a number of other, uh, I won't say their names, so that, that would be unfair, but I've had meetings in the last three months with uh, a, a few other uh, prime ministers and presidents from the EU. Um, they're all trying to do the same thing. They're all trying to get us to take jobs or investment or infrastructure to their countries. And some are doing a pretty damn good job of uh, getting us to do things. They're changing regulation, they're changing labour laws, they're becoming very pro-business. And you can sort of guess some of the countries and economies that are doing that. And the fact is that regulation and government is also a competitive environment. And here in the UK, we're quite bureaucratic, aren't we? Uh, we just are, and the regulations are typically gold-plated. And look, you can't stop some businesses failing. Business requires risks to go forward. If you cut out all risks, you don't move forward. And sometimes I think people think it's not okay for the occasional business to fail. Actually, it is. The question is what do you do when they fail to minimise the impact? Uh, I'm not frivolous on this stuff. You need to save the jobs and that sort of thing. Um, but too many of our things here in the UK, too many of the regulations are, are not competitive. They're not sustainable from a uh, global environmental perspective, but they're not competitive, and it's just bureaucracy. And um, I believe, think of it like this, if you are, 
uh, I'm from New Zealand, so I like rugby. Okay, so think of, think of a game of, uh, no, well, I'll choose football. We're in the UK, let's choose football. Um, I think the government, it's like, the government is more like, um, uh, I was going to say the International Football Association, oh, let's say UEFA, <laughs> it's better. The government sets the rules of the game, of the football game. That's like the government. Then the referees are like the regulators. They should just be on the sidelines refereeing the game, but not getting involved in the game. No one wants to see a referee scoring a try, a, a goal. And, and if you see what I mean, the regulators should be on the sidelines, not on the pitch, because the spectators want the game to be played and they want it to be played fair. And that's a bit like business. Mm. And the UK has to get more competitive, much more competitive in its, its regulatory environment, or we will lose trade to the US and to Singapore and to China and Hong Kong and so on. And in a digital world, most businesses like mine and many others can move domicile incredibly fast because it's now digital. Mm. And I guess, you know, I think, you know, I can appreciate your argument around regulators, but when I look back and from, you know, my understanding, that regulation's become strong because, frankly, some banks nearly destroyed whole elements of society and so governments feel that they didn't get that regulation so there's maybe there's some overcompensation but you know there's a responsibility on businesses to be good leaders and I'm interested you know when you look across your you know your top team the level down from that what are you missing what do you want more of um, why are you getting rid of people you know what is it that you know, is it's not the basic P&L, but what's it that really differentiates people that causes you to give them responsibility, promote them, um, and feel that you can trust them um, with, as you say, with a huge amount of, of capital um, in many cases? Yeah, because as you say, a lot of the problems we have, businesses have caused themselves, which is why regulators overreact. The problem is they usually react to the problem that was 10 years ago, not the problem coming up. But yeah, and leaders, look, it's simple. And... Uh, careful what I say, I have no problem firing people. Um, and I, I exit people as long as you do it in the right way and do it with dignity, but, and it's also I've got no problem hiring people. And the, the mistake I keep on making in my career is doing either of those too slowly. Either promoting people or firing people too slowly. Uh, and I've made that mistake a lot. And, uh, but I look for um, three things uh, in leaders, three things. And it might surprise you that experience is not one of them. And I'll come back to that in a second. But might, that might surprise you. And I look in three things. I look for intellect. It's like a computer. If you've got a computer that doesn't have the processing power, it doesn't do what you need. You've got to have intellect to make it work. Uh, you know, the fact that you're uh, in this fine university means there's, <laughs> in the room we've got a fair bit of that. You've got to have values. I don't mean honesty and integrity. Of course you've got to have those, but you've got to have values consistent with what the business wants to do at that time. Right, that's important. And the last thing I look for is simply drive. If you have all those three things, uh, the best people I've promoted are, are often ones I've taken a big bet on that people say, oh, they haven't got enough experience. Experience in today's world is massively overrated because the things and the business problems that I'm facing at the moment are not things we've ever faced before. Now, my industry, is one of the oldest industries in the world. Our company is the second oldest company in the UK, 1696. The Bank of England is the only one older. That was 1694, for what it's worth. And uh, in my office, I've got something from my original fireman's uniform that was dated 1696, this ornate arm um, plate, because right. we invented fire stations to protect our assets way back then in 1696. And, you know, if you, if you, if you have a look at, at those sort of things, it's all changed now and it's digital. Now the um, asset management industry, which is one big part of our business, and the insurance industry, which is the other big part, is still in the stone age. Yet we were one of the first users of big data. We asked questions in 1696 for life insurance, well actually a little bit later than that, for life insurance, and we would ask you, and we get a reference on you about how much you drank, had you had smallpox? Um, did you cough or spit blood? <laughs> I mean, it was fascinating stuff. Um, now we use big data and we're reinventing the industry. We're reinventing the industry so we don't have to ask any questions at all. We use big data. 
I have 600 data scientists. We use algorithms, so we actually don't have to ask you questions on your house. I know everything about your house. This gentleman in the front here, I, I know, if you, if you tell me where you live, I know what your house is made of, how big it is, what pipes are in it, how far you are away from a police station, fire station. I know the trees in your backyard and whether they're likely to fall in and break your window or whatever. And so we use big data. And my point is, I need people now that aren't based on experience but have the skills to look around corners and you don't even know what's around the corner because it hasn't been invented yet. So what you're saying is you need people to out... You know, machines can do the base bit. They yeah, can they suck can. data from can. however you register trees in people's gardens or how far they are. You know, you can do the geospatial stuff and all of that. Yep. It's almost the lateral thinking around risk, um, which right now artificial intelligence isn't capable of doing. It's capable of crunching numbers. Um, yeah, it is, and it's it's more that it's the proposition side. Uh, you know, artificial intelligence can do a lot. If you listen to a guy like Massa, you know, the SoftBank uh, founder. Um, and he believes you're going to get to singularity in 2040. You know, singularity where basically computers become totally, it's sort of that terminator moment, isn't it, I guess. Um, and he believes that will happen in 2040. Um, yeah, and I'm not worried about that either because, um, you know, humans evolve and fill the space. You know, when we started our company, we needed uh, buggy drivers and whip makers you know, for the horses and stuff. Now you don't need those. Now I can't hire enough data scientists, but I've probably got about a thousand too many actuaries. But guess what? I can turn actuaries into data scientists. So my yeah. final question will go out to the floor. Um, when you look around with the audience here, if you know now what you know and you're in their shoes, um, and not all, but a lot will be applying for jobs or in the midst of applying for jobs um, or going through changes in their careers. What kind of things would you be considering um, if you were at that point where you, know, you were starting out in a career or changing career or you know, you were, you'd, you'd maybe taken some time out of the world of work and you're going to go back into the world of work? Um, you know, if, if they're approaching people like you, what is it that they need to be presenting? What is it that's going to be really important if they're going to be successful? Um, I, I think there's a number of things. So, I know I've, uh, very as an individual, I, I built my career in doing the jobs no one else wanted to do. You know, when I took on Aviva, I had dozens of calls and emails from people saying, Mark, what the hell are you doing? Um, so if it's unfixable, and of course nothing's unfixable. Um, but I would, I would look at some of the hard stuff. I would look uh, at, the, at the direction it is going. Um, I think a lot of, you need to look at industries. I like, especially for a lot of people in the room, industries that are going to be transformed. Uh, that's one of the things that's been one of our success. I think we would be, well, at least we like to think we are the most advanced insurance company tech-wise in the world, particularly with our AI and big data. Um, you know, I now have I know, 700 people in Hoxton Square in Shoreditch in, in London and doing some very, very cool stuff. Uh, by the way, you can't wear a suit in there, they'll take it off you, it's, it's not good. Um, but I would look at the industries that are being disrupted. Um, I would have courage, um, you know, break the rule book. I really don't want people, um, a lot of people that we are hiring and I'm looking for people that do want to break the rule book. I don't mean take stupid risks and blow stuff up, that's not what I'm talking about. But I am saying that um, you know, there's, uh, experience is not the be all and end all now and I'm looking for smart people, driven people and people with values. And um, um, but the answer to that is different for each individual, so it's really hard to generalise. Um, you know, I'll no, no, no doubt be having the same uh, uh, discussion with my daughter who's sitting up the back, who is also at Oxford, uh, for what it's worth, and she said if I mentioned her name, she'd kill me. So, uh, <laughs> hi, Daniela, it's nice to see you. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Mark, thank you. I mean, we've covered a huge amount of ground, and I think... In all of that, there is a lot of opportunities. What I was trying to do was just, you know, we've had some great conversations tonight and other times as well. And I know you were at the forefront of, I think, trying to demonstrate a different type of leadership and a leadership that 
isn't what we saw succeeding in the 80s and 90s. Um, and it's not without its challenges. And so, you know, that should be rich pickings for you guys to come in with questions and go further into various areas. So, who would like to kick us off with a question? By the way, you can ask any question on any subject. Um, it doesn't matter how controversial. Kay. Yeah, hi. Yep. You, you can say your name too, just so I know who I'm talking to. My name is Ira, uh, yep. a student here. Yep. Uh, I'm uh, quite interested about big data science. Yep. Because you mentioned you have 600 science uh, in data, as mm -hmm. I see in data. Now I'm curious about what's the data source, because it could be social media, or could it, do you actually, another question is, yeah, great do question. you use the, the data from Facebook? Can you really buy some data from them, because they are actually looking into it? It, I mean, it's a great question. I think this is going to be an area of some regulation going forward. Um, our sources, we have 322 years of data, okay, and a lot of it's our own proprietary data that we use, and that's the most valuable. But we also hoover up a lot of data, so we'll hoover up... I'll get, what's an example? Um, one of the questions people ask in the UK when they're insuring their house is, how much of your roof is flat? You know why? Because if you've got a flat roof and it snows and the drains block and it causes floods or whatever. And it turns out that if you're answering the question on your own house, you only get it right about 65% of the time. Now, one of our algorithms looks at uh, Google Maps, it looks at council records, and we've scanned every council record in the UK, and we can tell with a 97.5% accuracy how much of your roof is flat by, by looking at photos, all automatic. So you can see those sort of data. We don't use um, social media stuff uh, much except for fraud. And we've had some, fraud's a big problem uh, in the UK. And we've had some very high profile cases. We had a professional footballer who uh, claimed a whiplash injury from us and we paid him out. And then on social media, when we were doing our automatic scans, we found he was scoring a goal the following weekend. <laughs> Not the smartest, you might say, right? So, so, um, so we don't. And now the questions that we have to ask inside is, what about genetics, for example? So the use of data is inevitable. Um, every tech firm in the world sells your data. Every single one. It's how they make most of their revenue. Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple. They all sell it. We have said we won't sell you data, okay, so we won't sell you data. We do buy data off some other sources, but we normally get it, it's normally public sources and our own algorithms. What about genetics? What about genetics? Now, we've actually been using genetic data forever. It's called family history questionnaires. You know, has your father or mother had a heart attack, say? We've been using that, and that's basically a crude form of genetic data, right? Um, now you can t map your genes for a hundred pounds. I've had mine done twice. I know my propensity to get diseases and all that sort of stuff. I've had the map twice for a hundred pounds. And so I think the use of data is inevitable. The question is how do you use it ethically? And I think that's a debate on some of the stuff that needs to be had. But um, if you're interested in data science, it's one of the fastest growing um, sectors in the world at the moment. You can make a lot of money out of it. You can do a lot of good as well with it. Uh, you can solve a lot of medical problems with it. You can do an enormous, enormous amount of good and help people's lives if it's used responsibly. And the question is, so maybe it's a question that can be debated here at this fine school. Um, yeah, but that's one of the questions. What else? Yeah, hi. hi. And then um, you next, yeah. My, my name is Tina. I'm also, I'm also an MBA student, and yep. I happen to be an actuary. Yep. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> actuary, data science, is not the same one. <laughs> great, great to know that. Because I've always got asked, um, what do you think like yeah. your job will be taken by machine in a couple of years of time? Yeah. But I guess my question is, um, I think two days ago, Amazon, Berkshire Hathaway, and um, yeah, JP they Morgan, they started yeah. this new venture yeah. um, going into um, house insurance business. Yeah. Um, and then you also mentioned on Aviva, you, um, the initiative is to um, employ more and more um, data scientists and yeah. then uh, maybe look at risk from a different angle. So what do you think is the competitive advantage that traditional insurance company have, but um, like advancing in terms of technology versus uh, like 
a real technology firm yeah. entering into Great this question. business space? Yeah, maybe we should talk. That's a very, very good question. Okay, so um, the JV you're talking about, uh, the quarter of that JV is actually a company called Berkshire Hathaway, as you know. Mm -hmm. You know, the Sage of Omaha, which most people don't realise is an insurance company. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's fundamentally an insurance company, so they get, they're giving them all the insurance expertise. And I see JVs as a key part of the future. So we have done a JV with Tencent. Uh, are you Chinese? Yes, I'm Chinese. Yeah. Okay, so you know Tencent well, right? Now, when I started first talking to Tencent was about two and a half years ago, and they were worth 200 billion. Now the um, US, they're now worth 500 billion US. Now we've done a JV with them, so that makes me pretty happy. Um, <laughs> and um, the advantages, though, you need. So why is why is insurance and asset management, which is a big part of our business too, but why is insurance in the Stone Age? Three reasons. One is um, just the regulation around it, which I think the regulation's too much, but it acts like a protective slime. And tech firms don't like regulation. Mm -hmm. They really don't. So that's one of the reasons. Second thing is it takes an enormous amount of capital. So um, Amazon couldn't have done it by itself, because although it's worth a lot of money, it doesn't have the balance sheet that Berkshire Hathaway has. So you need a huge balance sheet to get into it because of the risks. The third thing is the pricing. If you're Uber and you get the fares wrong in a taxi, what do you do? You just put your fares up. If your insurance company get it wrong, you will go broke because you have a long tail of liabilities, as you know, being an actuary. And by the way, the skills of being an actuary is fabulous training because you could do any job you like in a company like ours, including a data scientist, and will pay you more money to be a data scientist right now than there would be an actuary. But the skill set you've got is exactly what we need in other parts of the business. So too many times people pigeonhole themselves in a profession. When I see a profession, the qualification is just a route to whatever makes sense at the time. There's a question up the back here. Thank you. Um, right, I'm Cecile. Hi. Uh, and I'm, I'm not a student here, I, I have to say. But I'm interested in your views on leadership. So yep. um, having gone through uh, recruiting teams over time, I completely agree with looking for intellect, um, the right values and drive. I absolutely agree that those are the three most important qualities to look uh, for in, in people. But it, I think it might pose a, an issue for leadership education because I wonder what your view is on how much of that can be learned um, and how, uh, yeah, really, how, how much of that can be learned. You know, if you look for those three things, yeah. can, can they be learned at all? Yeah, um, uh, certainly some of them can. We, we, you know, we put in a lot of money last year just on uh, particularly training mid-level managers. We put in, I think, an extra 10 or 12 million into it just in, in what we were doing in that space. Now, you can't... Oh, this is a bit controversial, but you can't learn raw intellect, can you? Um, but when I say raw intellect, I don't mean you need to be a PhD. I just mean you need to be smart in a way. Maybe it's in understanding propositions. Maybe it's in maths as an actuary. Maybe it's, it's whatever it is. But you've got to have the raw skill to work with. Um, I think you can impact values because people do can um, develop in their values. And you can certainly develop leadership style. Um, I was lucky enough to have three key mentors over my, over my career. My uh, first boss was a woman, for what it's worth. And that's one of the reasons why um, in the UK I'm so involved in, in women in business and women in leadership, and the fact that I have three daughters, so we'll call that enlightened self-interest. <laughs> um, but... Um, and so things impact your value set as, as you get older. Um, and you can also learn techniques. So one of the things we were talking about with our middle uh, leadership was you know, how to manage performance. And we realised that you know, as we'd fix the balance sheet and fix the company, we had to fix some of the cultural issues. We realised a lot of our people had never been taught how to actually manage performance in the right way. How do you exit people when you're going to fire someone? How do you take a risk? How do you learn to see around corners? How do you innovate? What happens if what you're working, doesn't, uh, working on doesn't uh, work? And one of the things I realised we had to teach in our country, uh, country, in our company, and our country, this country, uh, is courage. And I know that sounds really strange, but 
you've got to have courage and make a decision because no decision is the worst decision in a lot of cases. Because if you make a decision that's wrong, you'll find out soon enough or someone else will. And uh, so look, I think it's a combination. If you've got the raw talent, um, I've got some people in my organization, I, I, take it, I took you know, my team, uh, particularly on women actually, and, and sometimes in my organization I found that the men always put their hands up and said they're ready for the job, and often the women didn't, even though they were the better candidate. And, and so I had to change my style and approach when promoting women and some, uh, sometimes convincing them to take the role and, and stuff like that. And some of those skills are learnt. And um, so I think it's a bit of both. A bit of both. Yeah. So I'll try and do some rapid fire to get through some, some more. Thank you, Mark. Fascinating. Uh, what is more dangerous from the UK, a clean-cut Brexit or Jeremy Corbyn? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say any question, didn't I? Um, <sighs> I'll, I'll answer it this way. Um, I see business as the biggest force for social good. Any government or environment that is anti-business would be very bad for the UK consumer and very bad for the UK economy and therefore very bad for UK people. You can deduce what you want from that. <laughs> I'm May, I'm uh, until recently a longevity actuary, um, arguably a data scientist as well. Uh, I'd like to know what are your thoughts on the classic social problem. So uh, generally poorer people and also younger people have greater need for insurance but are also less able to buy insurance. Yeah, and, and you know, um, it is a big issue because without insurance, the world doesn't function. Uh, if you came here on the train, you wouldn't have been because how, who would cover the liability if the a train had an accident? You wouldn't be in this building unless it was covered because you couldn't take the risk. You know, every part of your life, if you're going on public transport, if you're using the National Health Service, and also things like investments, you know, we fund billions and billions of pounds in NHS buildings or infrastructure or roads or schools or universities so the investments of, of companies like us, long-term investments, without it, the country just doesn't run. Now the problem is, on the big data questions we were talking about, as we get more and more data, it does mean that our underwriting gets better and better, and it does mean that worse risks are cut out. So it's not just the poor people, it's also vulnerable, peop vulnerable people. Uh, I'll give you some examples. We actually technically at the moment could collect 500,000 pieces of data on every single person in this room. Individual pieces of data already. At the moment, we actually use about 5,000 pieces of data, for example, if we're underwriting your home. Okay. Now, a good example in the UK is flood insurance. Now, councils were dumb and the government was dumb. Who builds on floodplains? Duh! You know what happens when you build on floodplains? You get flooded. <laughs> and if you know, and we've mapped every inch of the UK, every inch to within two inches of, uh, of where it's going to flood. We know when a storm comes in before it's going to flood, and we send people out. We call them the Yellow Army and Yellow Raincoats, and they help people fill sandbags and lift their TVs off the floor and stuff like that. Right, so protect their assets. But a lot of people then became uninsurable in the UK because they had houses on floodplains and we realised this is a problem. Now we weren't going to cover it because we went to the government and said, look, we're not a charity, you know, we do social good, but uh, how can we cover these people? So what we did, we agreed that the government put some money in, we would effectively tax everyone else a little bit, we put it into a pool called Flood Re, and so we could insure those people and we take some of the risk and the government takes some of the risk. I think that needs to happen a whole lot of other places as well. It's the same on pensions. You know, personally, I think the UK, like most other countries in the world, should have compulsory pensions, not just auto-enrolment. Because most people in our countries will not save unless they're forced to. And you put some from the employer and some from the employee, and that's the only way you can get real savings. And that's another way to do it. 
but I think the government and business has a role that we must fix this stuff together because you can't leave sectors of society out. Ross. Hi. Hi. Um, my name is Abrar Chaudhary. I'm a research fellow here. And we're doing a project on corporate purpose, yep. uh, looking at large corporations, what their purpose is. And you mentioned you know, in your talk that you know, um, a purpose of a corporation is more than profits. Yep. And I wanted to know, you know what is the purpose of Aviva? Yep. And how central is that purpose in all your decision making, especially when, when you're looking at business and you're looking at ventures? Okay. Yeah, great question. So our purpose is very really simple. We call it the fire uncertainty, which basically means we take the uncertainty away when bad stuff happens. So, um, yeah, and we uh, we basically came. We did this. De we developed that from a, a lot of research and thinking, and said, "What's been consistent through time for us?" So we started as a fire insurance company. It was thirty years after the Great Fire of London, which is what sixteen sixty six. Is it right? Someone help me. Yeah, yeah sixteen sixty six. So we started in sixteen ninety six, and we started as a fire insurance company because at that time the biggest fear people had was a fire. And in the UK at that time, and actually uh, the fire went right exactly through where our current building is, our main building. Uh, but at that time, if you lost your house, and there's a high chance you would lose your house, you lost everything. So we took that uncertainty away. And basically it's the same, whether it's now, whether it's cyber insurance or whatever we do, or even the investment side where we can take the uncertainty, because a lot of people don't know how to invest. And so we just say our role is to take the uncertainty away. And so as a CEO of a large financial institution, therefore, what's my first job? My first job is to make sure the company's there. And if the company isn't there, then I've totally failed. So the company has to be strong, and now we're, we're very strong. Um, uh, then my next job is to look at the propositions and say, in the uncertainty space, what are the things people really want? So. And I think the insurance industry's got, it, industry's got it fundamentally wrong. We ask too many questions, we have too many exclusions, um, and it's because it was built in a time when it was all about intermediaries and brokers. And the world's gone through four revolutions, haven't we? The, industrial, uh, the agricultural revolution, yeah, hunters to farmers, the industrial revolution, the services revolution, now the digital revolution. And the digital revolution has finally put consumers at the forefront where the services revolution put the corporations and intermediaries at the forefront at the forefront in the apex. And so our purpose has got to go along that way as well. And then the guiding principles behind the purpose is the values. So when we're making decisions, and there's some quite big issues today we were looking at, and someone brought up and they said, look, that's not consistent with the values. So the values actually get discussed as much as the purpose on the big calls. And um, if it's against the values, anyone in the organisation will call it out and say, that's not consistent. They go, oh, yeah, that's not. And you back off it. We've probably got time for one last question at the back here. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your speech. Very insightful and pleasant at the same time. Uh, I want to pick up on the gentleman's point and say that um, it's true you have values, but you also have a fiduciary duty towards your investor mm. to their best interest. And somebody would argue this is economic interest. So apart from your discretionary action to go and disinvest in tobacco companies or ask oil companies to improve, how you incorporate this in your corporate governance or corporate responsibility, mm. this social value for, uh, for the company? Uh, this, this is a fabulous question. It's, it's a great last question. I'll tell you why. Because it's one of my hobby horses. Um, I spoke at the UN General Assembly a few years ago and I spoke um, at the launch of the Sustainable Development Goals and I was representing global business. And one of the key points in my speech there was exactly this about fiduciary duty. Now the fact is that different countries around the world have a different definition of fiduciary duty. The US is a culprit here where they typically see their fiduciary duty as being short-term financial gain. Now, if you view fiduciary duty through a longer-term lens, you would make different decisions. So, for example, um, fiduciary duty on um, us influencing oil companies. 
if I view my fiduciary duty over the long term in a sustainability lens, remember I have liabilities of 30 and 40 and 50 years in my company, so I will call that enlightened self-interest. If we don't do something about climate change, I will make huge economic losses maybe in 5 or 10 or 15 or 20 years. So if I view it through that lens, it's incumbent on me to do something. If I view it on the three-month lens, I'd say, no, I don't have to do that. And I think that's total nonsense. Now, I'm currently in discussions with the G7, the G20, and the UN and OECD about getting a global uniform new definition of fiduciary duty that has long-term sustainability incorporated in it. If we are successful on that, we move the world a whole lot more forward because I believe that fiduciary and duty must take account of the long term. So fiduciary, but I could look at it from a purely financial end. Fiduciary duty, if I'm looking at the longer term, why is tobacco use in the UK and other more developed nations going down, yet in emerging nations going up? Why is that? Because regulation and tax has forced it out and smoking rates down in more developed countries because people realise it kills people. Yet in emerging markets, they'll hook people on it and it's a bit of a problem. Now, over the long term, the rates will go down there as well for the same reasons. What about, um, uh, what about oil? So, I believe the future of oil is limited. Look at, and there's a number of reasons for that. It's, again, it's countries like actually China. China's putting in the biggest single investment in EVs, um, LED lights, um, sustainable energy for one basic economic reason. You know what that is? No, that is, they don't have oil. So enlightened self-interest is a beautiful thing, and I am a believer that in business, and it's tied up fiduciary duty as well, enlightened self-interest, if you marry long-term sustainability with economic interests, you can do a whole lot of good, because I don't want to be part of a business world and a business culture that screws up the world for future generations. I'm not going to do that. And that's probably a really good Great place, place to, to end. <laughs> so, Mark, thank you.